Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Weekly Reads, where we bring you five book recommendations all in one show. My name is Devin. I'm a librarian at the Worcester Public Library, just like my co-host, Joy. How are you today, Joy? It's a little cooler today, so that's nice. Uh, so pretty yeah. well. How about you? Cooler weather is something we can both enjoy. <laughs> So if you haven't seen our show before, most everything we talk about is available through the online apps Libby or Overdrive. You can use those on your phone or device, or you can use the Overdrive website on your laptop or desktop, and it's all free. We're also doing physical pickup now, so if you want a print book or a book on CD or something like that, uh, you can do that, place it on order or call to order it, and then come pick it up when you're notified it's ready. So each slide for each book, if there's a book that sounds good, just see what uh, formats are listed on the slide. And if you're not sure how to place a hold or use Overdrive or Libby, just give us a call. So I'm going to switch screens so that you can see what we have in store for you this week. Okay, so just like every other time, I'm going to focus on the fiction. Joy, who reads nonfiction, will do the nonfiction. <laughs> And I will do the coming soon title as well. So for my first choice, we have The German House by Annette Hess. This book came out at the end of last year and December of 2019. It's an international bestseller set in 1963. And in the book, Hess asks readers to consider the importance of healing and the necessity of confronting the past. So in the book, Eva only has foggy childhood memories of World War II. She knows Frankfurt had been a smoldering ruin, damaged by Allied bombings, but that was two decades ago. Now it's 1963, and the once cratered streets are paved smooth, and new stores have replaced the rubble. Though she dreams of marrying her suitor and starting a new life, Eva's plans are upended when she's hired as a Polish to German translator for a trial. And as she becomes more involved in the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, she begins to understand the full extent of her country's deeds. Though it means going against the wishes of her family and her lover, Eva, propelled by her conscience, joins a team of prosecutors determined to bring the Nazis to justice. Publishers Weekly said this book was a strong debut, and the highlight, it, highlight of it is Eva. She's a complex and thoughtful woman who finds herself in the midst of a significant moment in history. So I thought this was an interesting one because normally when you think of historical fiction, it's in World War II. It's not a little bit after World War II. So I think it would be a very interesting time period to read about in Germany. If you're interested in this title, we have it in print physically and as an ebook. So here's one from Joy. Well, my first choice for this week is The Lincoln Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill America's 16th President and Why It Failed by Brad Meltzer and Josh Mentz. On a cold December day in the year 1860, a group of determined men met on the top floor of a commercial building in downtown Baltimore, prepared to do what they believed to be a sacred duty. When the time came, each extracted a ballot from a box placed in the center of the room. There was only one red ballot, and all understood that the one who drew it would carry out the assassination of the hated anti-slavery president-elect Abraham Lincoln as he passed through the city on the way to his inauguration. Well, the plot in both senses of that word sounds a bit dramatic, doesn't it? Like a story that an author of fast-paced thrillers like Brad Meltzer might find appealing. Was there really a conspiracy to kill Lincoln? Or was the whole story just the product of someone's overheated imagination? Scholars have been debating this topic for years and we may never know. No suspects were ever brought to trial, nor has any incontrovertible evidence ever emerged that an organized conspiracy ever existed. One thing is certain, however, Lincoln and his cohorts believed it. 
After all, in the context of the times, it wasn't exactly far-fetched. Consider what had happened four years before when Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner was nearly beaten to death on the floor of the Senate by a Southern colleague enraged over Sumner's stance on slavery. Or consider what happened just four months after the inauguration when Massachusetts troops passing through the city were attacked by a Baltimore mob and 10 soldiers were killed. And then of course there was John Wilkes Booth and perhaps many who shared his convictions, no doubt waiting in the wings. So better safe than sorry. Enter detective Alan Pinkerton and his crew, among them America's first female detective, Kate Warren. Together, they hatched a plan to bypass the seething Baltimore crowds and bring Lincoln safely to Washington. No secret, they did it, of course. But how exactly they did it, I'll let you find out. But ponder for a moment what might have happened had Lincoln not lived long enough to take office. Would his vice president, Hannibal Hamlin, have had the integrity the intelligence and the moral courage to save the union and end slavery. Maybe, but thank God we'll never have to find out. Wow, well, I've definitely heard about the John Wilkes Booth assassination, but I didn't know about this earlier attempt. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Sounds it. Okay, and here's another fiction. This is You Let Me In by Camilla Bruce. And this book came out not too long ago, just this year in April, 2020. And it's being called A Fairy Tale with a Twist. A stunning combination of the sinister domestic atmosphere of Gillian Flynn's sharp objects and the otherworldly thrills of Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, comparison. I don't normally think of those two authors being in the same category. So a little bit about this book. Cassandra Tip is dead, isn't she? After all, the notorious recluse and romantic novelist has always been prone to flights of fancy. Everyone remembers the shocking events leading up to her infamous trial. She may have been acquitted, but the insanity defense only stretches so far. Cassandra left behind no body, just her massive fortune, and one final manuscript, which her niece and nephew must read to the end if they want to inherit. But there are bodies in her past, her husband Tommy, whose mysterious disembowelment has never been solved, and a few years later, the shocking murder-suicide of her father and brother. Different versions of her life are offered to the reader, one in which she's possessed by a vampiric fairy entity and the other filled with domestic abuse and murder. Cassandra will tell you stories, but they come with a price. What really happened out in the woods and who has she been protecting? This book got a lot of praise from different journals and different authors, but I wanted to share a quote from the author Joanne Harris. She wrote Chocolat, The Girl with No Shadow, Five Quarters of the Orange, a whole bunch of good books. She said that this book, You Let Me In, is an exquisite rarity, nicely original and authentically folkloric, creepy, detailed, and entrancing. So I, I like that she said folkloric and contrast that with Gillian Flynn and Neil Gaiman. It just sounds like this book is kind of open-ended and has some different storylines, which I really enjoy in a book structure. So if you're interested as well, it looks like we have this book in every format. And here's another from Joy. I've read that book and it's everything they say it is, and the vampire dark fairy character is unforgettable. So wow. Highly recommended here. Good to know. All right, my next choice for this week is The Language of Butterflies, How Thieves, Hoarders, Scientists, and Other Obsessives Unlocked the Secrets of the World's Favorite Insect by Wendy Williams. I chose this book because I really wanted to accentuate the positive for once. I was not disappointed. The language of butterflies is not merely positive, it is positively delightful, and let's face it, 
While many of my past selections have been interesting or thought provoking or even riveting, few have been exactly delightful. Of course, how can a book that focuses on what the author with good reason calls the world's favorite insect be anything less? Other creepy crawlies may fascinate or repel or both. But the butterfly in all of its fragile, dazzling glory entices us to touch, study, collect, covet, and sometimes steal as many specimens of the 24,000 known species as we can find, name, count, and catalog. Meanwhile, avid conservationists, young and old, amateur and professional, commit their lives to preserving butterflies and the habitats in which they thrive often against heavy odds. In this work, science writer Wendy Williams tells us much of what science has learned so far about the butterfly, what and how they eat, how they mate, and how they famously transform from the sturdy earthbound caterpillar into one of the most exquisite and ethereal creatures on earth. She examines the mystery of butterfly migration, focusing on if they go, why they go, how they go, and most puzzlingly, how in the heck they know where they are going. She shares stories that unless you are already familiar with the ins and outs of butterflydom, may just knock your socks off. Just one example. The monarch butterfly throughout its life cycle is totally dependent on the milkweed plant. However, many varieties of milkweed contain toxins and if the young caterpillar consumes too much, he may die. If, however, that caterpillar survives to become a butterfly, she will not only be immune to those toxins, but they will make her unpalatable to predators who have learned from a bitter experience not to eat her. You can't make stuff like this up. The bad news is that butterfly populations across the world are declining precipitously. However, Williams remains hopeful. She says that we have learned so much about the adaptability of butterflies and the conditions they require in order to flourish that those of us who do not want to live in a world devoid of the joy and color they bring can do a great deal to arrest their decline. Start, she says, by planting a little milkweed. I would have subtitled this book, Everything You Didn't Know You Needed to Know About the Butterfly and Why You Are So Glad You Now Do. Hey, Joy, can I tell you a story about a caterpillar? You may. So I saw on the news the other day that there's a caterpillar nicknamed the Mad Caterpillar. And it's, uh -huh. because, <laughs> it's because the, the caterpillar molts its head several times as it's growing. But instead of just leaving the old head in the forest somewhere, it puts it on top of its, its existing head and then it stacks them up so that the caterpillar, just because of its stack of heads, can get up to half an inch high. And it uses it as a defense mechanism, as like a rhino horn to fight <laughs> off predators, also to make itself look bigger and more intimidating. I just thought that was fascinating. Oh my goodness. What did I say <laughs> about not being able to make this stuff up if you tried? Oh, it's true. That's nature for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here is our coming soon title. I chose a title that comes out a little later. It's not coming out this week, but next week. This is Winter Counts by David Heska Wanbley Wyden, and it comes out on August 25th, which is Tuesday. It's one of the most anticipated books of the year by Library Journal, Crime Reads, BuzzFeed, and Booklist. Uh, just so you know, it took me a while to figure it out, but that is a buffalo that's sideways. I thought it looked like a rat with uh, horns. Yeah, it took me a while, too. <laughs> so this book is being called A Tour de Force of Crime Fiction. In it, the main character is Virgil Wounded Horse, and he's the local enforcer on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. When justice doesn't come from the American legal system or the tribal council, 
Virgil is paid to deliver punishment that's hard to forget. But when heroin makes its way into the reservation and finds his nephew, Nathan, things get personal. He enlists the help of his ex-girlfriend, Marie Shortbear, and tries to learn where the drugs are coming from and how to make them stop. They follow a lead to Denver where drug cartels are rapidly expanding and forming new alliances. And back on the reservation, a new tribal council initiative rises, raises questions about money and power. As Virgil starts to link the pieces together, he must face his own demons and reclaim his native identity. This book got a lot of great words from all kinds of journals and different authors, including Native American authors. Uh, but I wanted to share a quote with you from the best-selling author of the Joe Pickett series, which is C.J. Box. He writes a lot of uh, mysteries who take, that take place out west. He said, I've been waiting most of my life for this book without realizing it. Winter Counts is a knowing, authentic, closely observed novel about modern day Lakotas that rings absolutely true, warts and all. The sense of place is breathtaking and raw. It's a hell of a debut. So I just think everything about this book sounds great. It's one of the most anticipated titles of the year. It's crime fiction, it's Native American, uh, you know, the recurrent situation. If you're interested in this book, there is a record for it in the catalog for the print version if you want to put a hold on it. But we don't have anything on Overdrive and Libby yet, but hopefully we will soon. And that brings us to the end of our episode for the week. Thanks so much for watching. And don't forget that if there is a, an author you want a recommendation on or a title or a genre or subject, just put it in the comments below and join us. We'll see what we can do. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. See you later, fellow readers.